What's going on, everybody? Brandon Scoopy Robinson, senior writer at Heavy.com and the host of Heavy Live with Scoop B. Welcome to everyone who is tuned in on Heavy on Lakers, Heavy on Celtics, Heavy on Bulls, and on Periscope. Uh, at Scoop B on Twitter via Periscope, as well as on YouTube, uh, heavy.com. Uh, we are everywhere you want to be um, and guaranteed to be there even on Sundays. And uh, today is Wednesday, and one guy that probably someone that I've wanted to speak to for a long time is to my right. It's none other than the original AD, Antonio yeah. Daniels, NBA champion. What's going on, sir? What's up, brother? Let me, let me correct you. Adrian Dantley is the original AD. I, I don't count. Okay. <laughs> you sound like voting when people say I don't count. <laughs> yeah, no, no. With, with, with the career that that man has had and paved the way for guys like me to come in and play in this league, no, no, he is the original AD for sure. But did I appreciate he, the thought, though. Did he tell you that he was the original AD? No, he doesn't have to. <laughs> he doesn't have to. All right, follow up to that. How is Anthony Davis holding up to the name AD? Oh man, like he's special. <laughs> he's special. Um, there, there's not much that I can say about Anthony Davis that has not been said, and he continues to show different different elements of his game. You know, last night the move that Frank Vogel and the coaching staff made to put Anthony Davis on. Jimmy Butler, after Jimmy Butler just came off of a historic game in game three, a 40-point triple-double, and he took the challenge. I, I, I love that. How many bigs in the league can you honestly say have the agility, athletic ability, size, and quickness to stay in front of and bother a guy like Jimmy Butler for a full 48-minute game? You know, it, it's almost like – when he goes to the Lakers, he obviously um, has grown, but his legend continues to grow the closer that he gets to an NBA championship. Antonio, you uh, recently, i say within the last year, you sat down with a buddy of mine, a uh, writer in Landon Buford, and you said that Anthony Davis does not remind you of Tim Duncan. Mm -mm. Why? Because they're two completely different players, you know, two totally different players. The only way that they would remind me of each other would be um, their mannerisms to a certain degree. Even sure. though Tim was not even as, as um, you know, Anthony Davis doing, you know, the things that he does and, you know, hitting buzzer beaters and so on and so forth. Like, that's not Tim. Tim hits buzzer beaters and he walks off the floor, you know. Um, but their games are completely different. I, I still laugh with Tim about today, till today, that he had he didn't have one athletic bone in his body. That's what enabled him the opportunity to play so long. He never had to recreate himself. So he was the big fundamental from Wake Forest all the way till he was done playing with the San Antonio Spurs. Anthony Davis is a flat out athlete. He is a flat out athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, their skill sets um, are similar. And the fact that they can both shoot the ball, they're both very smart, great rim protectors, you know, and great teammates. But their games in particular, they don't parallel to one another to me. Is Kevin Garnett more of a fair comparison? Yes. Yes. Even though Kevin Garnett is, yeah, definitely a, a, a more fair comparison. But Anthony Davis' skill set is even uh, different than Kevin Garnett's. You know, Anthony Davis is a dude that at one point was a point guard. And you can still see that translate to today's NBA. He's mm -hmm. not a big when he gets the ball. You're thinking, man, you better get rid of it. You better get rid of it. You're comfortable and confident with him having the ball in transition and making plays. How many bigs in today's NBA can you actually say that about? Not many of them. Not many. Not many. You are point guard, so you obviously understand point guard and Anthony Davis transitioning from point guard to big man and having that growth spurt. Um, you yourself, uh, an alum of St. Francis de Sales High School in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, you spent time at Bowling Green. From You're smiling as I'm saying this, 93. Yeah, because it, it, it just reminds me how old I am. That's all. Don't ask, don't tell. So you were the fourth overall pick in the 97 NBA draft out of Bowling Green. What I find interesting, 
Um, number one is that you have I guess that color is teal in the back or not. I don't I don't know. It's that mint that that Vancouver, not Memphis. That Vancouver Grizzlies jersey. That is a rarity right there. Tell me about when I think of Vancouver, I think about the TV show Twenty One Jump Street. It was taped there. I didn't know that. You just you know what? Yeah, you, you just got me right there. You just got me right there. Uh, okay. You know what's funny? When what? you think about Vancouver, you won't think about basketball. Okay. That's why they don't have an NBA team there anymore. Right. Because no matter what the situation was, they always came second to hockey. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the city. I, 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 if anyone out there is listening and you have an opportunity to go to Vancouver for vacation, go. go. What makes it so special? It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It is a melting pot of different cultures, ethnicities, um, histories. Like it is, it is a beautiful place to be. Beautiful place. And, and be, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm from the inner city of Columbus, Ohio. So at 18 years old, 19 years old, graduating college at Bowling Green State University and then getting drafted to Vancouver at 21 years old and then going there and seeing a completely different part of the country that being from the inner city of Columbus, Ohio, I was never blessed to see or even know about. That place is beautiful. I loved it, but it is a hockey city. It's a hockey city. You talked about Tim Duncan mm -hmm. um, not not having to adjust his game. I mean, in the past, I've sat down with Sharif Abdul Rahid, I love you. Um, and we've talked about the, the the Slam Magazine cover and all that other stuff. But I'm I'm curious from my perspective. I feel like Sharif adjusted his game, and obviously knee injuries and things of like that sort. He had to adjust, but. I'm having a hard time. I feel like Sharif was ahead of his time the way he switched. Okay. Great point. Small between small forward and power forward. What was special about him then, and who does he remind you of now? Man, great question as far as who he reminds me of. I'm going to have to think about that one. What was special about Reef at that time is even at that time, he couldn't be stopped. He really could not be stopped. Do you know what, what – Stop Reef and what slow Reef down was his knees. That was it. You know, understand, he didn't play, have a long college career. I think he was one and done. Mm -hmm. But when I got to Vancouver, he was in his second year in the league at that time. Because when I went to Vancouver, it was their third year. It was country, big country Reeves. They drafted Reef and they drafted me. But when I got to Vancouver, even at that time, and Reef was in his second year in the NBA, his knees were weren't holding up. You know, he's icing all of the time. And this is a young man that at the time is 20 years old, 21 years old, if that. But when you put him out there on that floor, his skill set was incredible. His skill set was incredible. Did you like his game better when he fasted or when he didn't have to fast? Did you notice the difference between the two? I, I didn't know the difference in the two. I didn't. To, to me, he was... He was a walking bucket. He was. He was a walking bucket at, at that size, um, 17, 18. Because remember, the NBA was different then. It's evolved so much now to an analytic-driven NBA, mm -hmm. where teams won layups, dunks, threes, and free throws. That's it. That's it. But Reeves, 15 to 17-foot jump shot for a power forward at that time. The option to pick and pop the option to pick and put the ball on the floor and make a play for himself and his teammates. Mm -hmm. But at that time, in 1997, yeah, Reef was a problem. Yeah, I look at him like looking fat, back and forward. I feel like he was a combination of KG, Lamar Odom, and Mello mixed with Glenn Robinson at the same time. Yeah, you just threw – see, you didn't give me that option. You said, who does he remind you of? You didn't say I can pick four or five dudes. This interview is about you. I was just giving you my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is still yours. Do you do you have a, a comparison? I don't. But I mean, see, what, what you just said, Scoop, is you gave a little bit of a lot of guys. But you know what a lot of those guys have in common? Is they can score. Yeah. They can score. You think of Melo, you think of uh, Glenn Robinson, like these dudes, because poor, you think of the, the length and elasticity of K KG, like 
Yeah, these dudes can store. Lamar Odom was a another dude. I honestly feel like, even though he was really, really good in the NBA at that time, he was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time. That dude in today's NBA would be um, almost Luca like to a certain degree, where you're going to put the ball in his hands and mm -hmm. say, We're going to put four guys around you whose skill set complements yours. We trust your decision making ability and we trust your skill set. Lamar Odom was a point guard. He was a point guard playing the four position at that time. He was ahead of his time as well. He was KD length with LeBron's skill set. Yeah. Not the score LeBron was, but lanky, ball handling. He was a matchup. He was a matchup nightmare. Yeah. He was a matchup nightmare because it, it is just similar to, to, to KD. You can't put guys on him, just like Luka. Who do you put on Luka? If you put someone that's bigger, he can – really space the floor with this skill set and his ability to create space. You put someone smaller, he can use his size, his girth to create space. So he was another one of those guys like Kevin Durant. Who do you put on Kevin Durant? Who do you put on that guy to make it tough? Ty Lu. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and, and the thing is, the guys who have given Kevin Durant the most problems have been guys that can get under him. Yeah. First Paul, you know, yeah. those kind of guys. But he still has the ability to just turn and shoot. Too it's, good. It's it's almost like you're tall. I'm 6'5". You're what, 6'6"? Six, 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 you know, growing up, you didn't want to have them fights with them guys that were smaller than you. Because you right. got to put you in your groin, your stomach, and your knees. <laughs> you know, because they got that lift versus the guy that's short that can steal the ball. And you can't see it. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I think of when I was in high school. So I went through a growth spurt in high school. When mm -hmm. I went to high school, I was five foot two. Five foot two, 120 pounds. When I left high school, I was six foot four, 170 pounds. So I went through a huge growth spurt in high school. Okay. And one thing I remember, my senior year, there was a guy in high school I literally hated to play against. <laughs> Because when he was a freshman at another school, we were the same size. I grew to 6'4". He grew about three or four inches. So as opposed to being 5'5", five, 5'2", five, five, he was now 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, I was 6'3", 6'4". And almost like Muggsy Bowles. You know how like, you see pictures of Muggsy? He's never backed off anybody. He is right under somebody. So if you put the ball down, he's right there. And this dude in high school was that dude for me. Everywhere you turn, he was right there. So that's that that small guy thing that you hate to play against with quick hands and quick feet, and they understand angles, and, yeah, very, very frustrating to play against. I, I want to add this up before I forget. When I look at Lamar Odom, to me, while you talk about uh, or we make comparisons to who he is, mm -hmm. in my mind, because I was a nerd watching basketball as a kid, I always compared him to Bob McAdoo. Mm. I feel like Bob McAdoo was ahead of his time. See, but, you know, now with the way that the game has gone, with the evolution of the game, there are so many guys that you can look back at throughout the course of history. I'm talking about even guys that didn't have, like, great NBA careers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm talking about guys like Keith Van Horn, guys like Austin Crozier, mm -hmm. shooting bigs, that at the time were called soft. But in today's NBA, the ability to step out and shoot that basketball would be welcomed. You know, so there's a lot of guys throughout the course of history that if we look at their skill set, we can say, man, you know what, this dude, regardless as to what was the eventual outcome of his overall career, was ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. When I look at you, um, you were traded. So we talked about the Vancouver Grizzlies. You were traded. You, you found your way to the San Antonio Spurs, and you were part of that championship team. Mm -hmm. um, the 99-2000 season, that was the blackout short season, correct? Yep. 1998-99. Okay. Thank you. So when I look at you um, and your skill set, I feel like you were a 6'6 point guard, but to me, just your size because we were spoiled with the Mark Jacksons, the John Stockton's, um, 
to me, you always look like a shooting guard, even though you were a point guard. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, in Popovich's system, it reminded me in some respects similar to Phil Jackson, where the point guard was predicated, you know, you, you played with big guards. Like, when you look at Phil Jackson, Ron Harper found his way to the Bulls and then L.A. How did you have to adjust your game in San Antonio to complement Duncan Robinson? Well, did you play like a traditional point guard? How did you shift your role if, if you had to? Well, I, I tell you, I tell you honestly, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you the hardest thing for me as a NBA basketball player. Um, everybody who is drafted, especially in the lottery, you know, and I was blessed to go fourth overall. Everybody who was, you know, drafted high in the lottery dominated at, in college. You were that dude. You were that dude in college. You know, and, I, and, and again, at the time, I played four years. Um, I was in the top ten in scoring and assists. The most difficult thing to carry over from college to the NBA isn't your skill set. It's the confidence in your skill set. That's why when I sit back today and I watch guys like Tyler Hero, the thing I respect about him so much is he has carried that swagger and confidence over from Kentucky to Miami. That's hard to do. That is hard to do. And if as confident as I was at Bowling Green State University under Jim Laranator, if I could have carried that same confidence over to Vancouver and then take that same confidence to San Antonio, my career trajectory and my career may be completely different, mm -hmm. but it's hard to do that. And then to when you're used to being that guy, you know, the ball's in your hand down the stretch in college. You make the decision. You make the plays. The outcome of the game is on your shoulders. And then you go to a situation where you are more of a, of a role player, you know, um, as opposed to playing 36 to the 40 minutes in college in a 48-minute NBA game. You know, you may play 20 to 25 minutes. Your confidence takes a hit. Your mentality takes a hit. So for me, I had to learn to adjust to the NBA game because the speed of the game is different. Scoop, when I got to college, the shot clock was 45 seconds. It was a 45-second shot clock when I got to college. It is? Yes. So, so think, about it. <laughs> think about how many times you can go through your offensive sets and not get anything and then go through it again, not get anything, and go through it again. Take off 21 seconds, and you are talking about an NBA shot clock. The speed of the game, the athleticism of the players, the, the overall IQ of the guys. And for me to come into San Antonio is where I learned what the term professional athlete meant. You know, and I think a lot of guys don't really grasp that concept. You know, playing with guys like Avery and David and Sean Elliott and Steve Kerr and Danny Ferry, uh, Terry Porter, Jerome Kersey, all these guys were veterans, battle tested that had been there before. And I learned so much from playing behind and with these guys. Yeah, Avery Johnson, uh, I covered the Nets there first year in Brooklyn and uh, kind of didn't end well, but just talking to him and picking his brain about um, X's and O's, I felt like I was in um, charm school. I was in a PhD program because right. I learned a lot, and he's so passionate about the game. Um, and then the voice tickles you, but once you, you, you oh man, oh man, don't 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 even get me started. Hey, I, I tell you know I still talk to Avery a ton today, and right. you know being the the color analyst in New Orleans, I I he he comes down to New Orleans a good amount. Believe it. <laughs> so this year we were playing. Um, the Chicago, uh, no, the Cleveland Cavaliers, Colin mm -hmm. Sexton, who will play for Avery at the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Derek Favors, who played for Avery. You know what I mean? In, in the NBA, though. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're all after the game and we're talking, and I told them there is no way possible, there's no way possible that I could ever play for Avery because when he gets mad <laughs> that Twain comes out, the mm -hmm. twang comes out, and I can't take you serious. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Even as a teammate of Avery's, I was in the locker room with Avery, and I have seen Avery blow up and mm -hmm. just have steam coming out of his ear. And I'm there in tears. I am in tears. Like, he has the, the best accent 
mm-hmm. match with the personality of of, of anyone. Mm-hmm. Tell me something, the New Orleans Pelicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do color commentating um, for them. Two part question: One, what do you make of their season? And two, what do you think of their future? Oh, man. What do I make of the season? Disappointing because they didn't make the playoffs. And I know coming into this season that we're making the playoffs is one of the goals. Mm-hmm. But there are certain things that you have to put in perspective here as well. Um, health is everything in this league. I'm not telling you something you don't know. So when you start out the season and you don't lose a preseason game and you have all this momentum heading into the regular season and then the number one overall pick and the guy who is the most touted since LeBron James goes down. That changes things. That changes things. Now, as opposed to having those high goals, you start out six and 23 on the wrong side of history, losing the most games in a row in New Orleans Pelicans history. But then there's a flip side to that because then what comes of that is when he goes down, it gives guys like Brandon Ingram an opportunity to become that first year NBA All-Star. You know, Lonzo Ball, slowly but surely growing into himself. And now you start out six and 23, and when the year is done, as far as the hiatus hit in the second week of March, you are still in a position to make the playoffs. So then even when you return from the hiatus into the bubble, my thought process coming into that bubble was the New Orleans Pelicans are going to get to that ninth or eighth spot and still have an opportunity to make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So as disappointing as it was to start, to see this team kind of pick up and get to where they got to says a lot about the resiliency of this team. That was this year. You can't take away um, not making the playoffs and the way that guys played in the bubble, the way the team played in the bubble, the disappointment that came with that. The future is something else, though. The future is something else to look at. You know, as far as having eight guys under the age of 25, you know, um, Brandon, B.I., uh, Zion, Zoe, whose skill set complements those two so well. You know, Jackson Hayes. And not just that, you have future assets. So you have draft picks moving forward to build with as well. Do you look at the Pelicans um, and say to yourself, I guess, do you have a coach, in your opinion, in your personal opinion, in mind, who would fit that growth process? That's hard, man, because it's um, with such a young team, you player development is obviously so incredibly important. Mm-hmm. And it's not just a young team. It's a team that's going to get younger with the assets that David Griffin was able to acquire in the Anthony Davis deal. Mm-hmm. So when you start talking about drafting this year and having a uh, first round draft pick, and I believe two second round draft picks, the team is not going to get that much older. You know, mm-hmm. there's obviously different things that you can do with trades or uh, be a free agency, but the team is going to get younger. And I think one of the most important things, obviously, is accountability. That's incredibly important when you're dealing with a younger team um, and also player development. You want because the future of this team is going to be on guys taking that quote unquote next step. Right. I took that next step from LA to this year. You're going to need Zion to take that next step. You're going to need Lonzo Ball to take that next step. Jackson Hayes, Nikhil Alexander Walker. So player development. And I think whoever this next coach is, that has to be high on his list. Chris Finch is a guy whose name has been tossed around a lot as a potential coach. Um, Houston has been tossed around a lot. What do people, you look at certain names that are not household names, like you know Mike D'Antoni, you know what you know. You can say, I know. but like David Vanderpool is another name that sticks out. But from a perspective of like Chris Finch, what should people know about him that they don't know? Well, the thing is, he's an, he's an offensive mastermind. 
You know, that, that's the thing. Like, he know, he was the offensive coach for the New Orleans Pelicans. So the ability to get up and down the floor, the ability to have guys in shape, conditioning. And I tell you the biggest thing with Chris, Coach Finch, that guys don't understand and, and fans don't understand the importance, he already has a rapport and a relationship with the players. That means something. You know, um, as an assistant coach, there are guys that you get attached to. There are guys that you talk to. Before the game, you're sitting down and you're watching film with B.I. or you're watching film with Zion and you're breaking down film with Zoe. That carries weight because with that rapport and with that relationship comes trust. So him being here for a while now under Coach Gentry, he's had an opportunity to kind of have a little head start so to speak, because he has a rapport and a relationship with these players that other coaches won't have. I was texting with Stefan Marbury recently, and one of the things that he said, we, we both touched and agreed on, as they say in the church, um, is uh, we, we were talking about Andre Miller, Drew Holiday, and Terrell Brandon, and about how underrated they are. Yep. When you look at Drew Holiday, why is he so underrated? Because he's so quiet. Okay. Because he's so quiet. And, and, and here's the thing. It depends on when we say underrated, who are we referring to? Because he's not underrated with his peers. That makes sense. You know, like he's underrated in the media because he's not flashy, you know, but talk to his peers. You know, you've heard Kevin Durant. I've heard Kevin Durant. I've heard uh, Damian Lillard all say that Drew Holiday was the best individual backcourt defender in the league. And when we are talking about those two guys, we aren't talking about role players. We are talking about high level elite scorers. For Kevin Durant to say that, for Damian Lillard to say that, all there's 450 dudes in this league. Mm -hmm. And for them to signal out, single out Drew Holiday and say, look, man, there's nobody in this backcourt can, that can defend like Drew Holiday can. That speaks volumes when it's coming from guys of that magnitude. Chris Paul is the attention of many NBA teams. Uh, I've counted it's about seven or eight. Um, do you like him in Oklahoma City? I, I like him in Oklahoma City if it depends on the, the direction you're trying to go. You know, mm -hmm. and it makes you think because they offer Billy Donovan a two year deal prior to even going into bubble. Right. And he turned that deal down. And it, it, it kind of makes you question the conversation that was had. Was it a conversation basically saying, we have reached the ceiling with this Oklahoma City roster. What we're going to do, we're going to take a wrecking ball to this roster, starting with Chris Paul. Then other guy is a free agent. Um, so maybe Steven Adams. And we are going to start over with the amount of assets that we received in the Paul George deal. So now, as opposed to retooling, now you're rebuilding. And I don't like Chris Paul in a rebuilding situation. I don't like him in a rebuilding situation. I love him in a contending situation. I think that he deserves a better outro than to be put in a position to lead, um, to have to be heroic every single night at his mm -hmm. age with all that he's accomplished. You know, um, but he's also still good enough to be the difference from a team that is a quote unquote borderline contending playoff team. He can be the difference between making them a championship team. I was on a podcast in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago and I said, I used this Erica Badu analogy you know, Erica Badu likes to be a doula. She likes to help in the delivery, to take care of the baby. I said, they're going to take this phrase and run with it. But Chris Paul is the NBA doula. He's able to take care of young teams and make them special. Right. And that's what he did in Oklahoma City. I, I told people before the year started, if Chris Paul stays in Oklahoma City, they'll make the playoffs. Because mm -hmm. I was blessed to play with CP in New Orleans. And I tell people constantly, he's one of the best leaders I've ever seen. And... He had an opportunity to go to Oklahoma City this year and completely recreate his image. Think about what was perceived about Chris Paul. Because remember, in, in Lob City, 
it was DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin. Ah, you know, and they don't get along well with Chris Paul. Mm-hmm. Then you go to Houston. And then it's, oh, well, you know, him and James Harden, you know, their relationship is unsalvageable. So now people start looking on the outside like, man, the common denominator here is Chris Paul. When I played with CP in New Orleans, the thing I loved about him, and this is what leadership is, he holds you accountable. When you don't do what you're supposed to do and you're not where you're supposed to be, he'll tell you about that. And a lot of times guys don't, guys don't accept that very well. Wow. And that's what you saw going in Oklahoma City was a situation where him and Billy Donovan were together. This was the first time, because I was, I was with Oklahoma City the previous four years prior to coming to New Orleans this year. This was the first time in Billy Donovan's four-year tenure that he's had an opportunity to coach. And what I mean by that is every year, one of his top players is a free agent. Kevin Durant was a free agent, and then Paul George was a free agent, and then Russell Westbrook was a free agent. Do you know what it's like to coach stars during their free agent year? What you have to do, how you have to cater to those guys. So now you have Chris Paul coming in, who's already established, his contract is taken care of. You have Steven Adams, who's there, his contract is established, he's already taken care of. Shea Gilgis Alexander, and the thing that we know about Billy Donovan is he knows how to connect with young players. You don't, you're not a back-to-back NCAA champion by accident. So now sure. him and Chris Paul were on the same level, and what you saw is the benefits of that, of them getting and accomplishing a lot more than a lot of people thought they would. What benefit, because Shea Gilgis Alexander was already called before Chris Paul right? mm-hmm. during, during his time with the Clippers. He was just on a stack squad, um, but you saw flashes of that brilliance. Coming in Oklahoma, um, some people may have thought that he, he would have been like in Chris Paul's way. And I, I didn't think that way. I think they right. were in each other. Um, what benefit do you think Shea goes just out of there that has from playing under Chris Paul? Cool. The, the, the benefit of learning more than just playing the game, but thinking the game. You know, and that's what Chris Paul forces you to do. Anybody can go out there and hoop. I play with a whole bunch of dudes that can that can go. And I think one of the worst things that I've heard as a young player growing up is coaches saying, don't think, just play. No, you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to think and react. Sure. And what Chris Paul forces you to do is think the game. He is not a selfish superstar. He's a selfless superstar. So there are certain games where he'll have four field goal attempts. And he'll allow Shea Gilgis Alexander to do him. He'll allow Danilo Gallinari the opportunity to do him. But when that opportunity presents itself for him to be the all-star and superstar that he is, he takes advantage of it. So Shea Gilgis, like, I don't think he could have asked for anything better than to be tutored by a guy like Chris Paul in the twilight of his career. And that'll pay dividends, especially when Chris Paul's gone. It's like Vince Carter uh, in Atlanta and Jamal Crawford if he returns to Brooklyn. Million dollar question. The internet says that Oklahoma City Thunder is interested in you. If offered the job, would you take it? Uh, I, the thing is, I, I, I love to coach. I've had my own basketball camp for 20 years. I mm-hmm. love teaching the game of basketball. Um, and I, I love, I literally, and I can't say this enough and with enough passion behind it. I love the fan base in Oklahoma City. I do. Like, when I retired, my first team-affiliated job was with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Obviously, I've had radio shows and so on and so forth, but my first team-affiliated job was with the Oklahoma City Thunder. And that fan base is so invested they are so passionate, and I love that fan base in Oklahoma City. Um, and I, I know Sam. You know, Sam Presti was the video guy here in San Antonio when I was a Spur. So, um, I, I, of course, would I would I seriously think about it? Of course, I would. Like, I would be a fool to sit there and say no. If I was offered a head coaching position after never uh, having any coaching experience at the NBA level, I would turn it down. No, I, w- I would love the opportunity. I would love the opportunity to um, to prove myself as a head coach, you know, to uh, take what I have learned from Jim Laranega and Greg Popovich and Nate McMillan, you know, and Byron Scott 
you know, and all the coaches that uh, Doug Collins, all the coaches that I was blessed to play under that have impacted my life and now had the opportunity to build my own culture and to think what that would look like. I leave that portion there, uh, pulling and cheering for you on that level. Um, when I look at um, the NBA at large, mm -hmm. um, you're seeing the 90s guys now get head, head coaching position, Steve Nash with Brooklyn, um, even to the perspective of um, Jerry Stackhouse. Right. Um, and the, a heck of a coach, too. What you said? Jerry Stackhouse, a heck of a coach. Just missed that opportunity because of Nick Nurse, but at the same time, um, I remember sitting down with Stack, and one of the things he shared with me, and, and it sounded just like you, um, he said that his biggest coaching influences, Dean Smith, Greg Popovich, Don Nelson, um, and uh, I think Avery Johnson as well, but also Carlisle. So when I hear you give pay homage in that regard, um, it's it, – it's a, it's a sign that number one, I'm getting old, but number two, okay. you guys are now in a position where you're becoming front office guys and you're becoming head coaches. And I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, oh, you know, realistically, it comes down to a point, all you need, like it is in anything in life, um, the most important thing we have in life is our relationships. You know, whether horizontal or vertical, the most important thing that we have in life is relationships. But relationships also come down to someone taking a, a chance on you. You know, like, okay, well, tell me your defensive philosophy. Tell me your offensive philosophy. If you could build a culture, what would that culture look like? And being able to articulate that well enough to a decision maker to say, you know what, this, this guy's worth taking that shot on, you know? So, and, and there are a lot of guys that, you know, you look at guys like Chauncey. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time before Chauncey Billups is roaming the sidelines as the NBA head coach. Jerry Stackhouse, a matter of time before he's roaming the sidelines as an NBA head coach. And there are guys out there that have done and served their time. You think of guys like Sam Cassell, you know, Darvin Ham. There are so many guys out there that because Darvin Ham is coached under Bud. Bud was under Pop for a number of years. Sam Cassell has been under Doc Rivers. Like, what, how... What better can you ask for as far as learning every day and also learning how to lead, mold, and guide young men? So it's a lot of players, you know, even players like myself that have never coached like that before. And there are a lot of players out there that are deserving, that are out there, you know, basically in the trenches every single day that deserve an opportunity as well. Tell me something. You played for the Seattle Sonics from 2003 to 2005. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing at some point you and Ray Allen crossed paths in Seattle. Oh yeah, yeah, Ray, my boy. Do you miss Seattle basketball, Sonics basketball, and do they deserve it on the team? I do. Yes, yes, and yes. I, I miss it, um, and yes, they deserve the team. That is a sports city. W with all due respect to Vancouver, which is something that we touched on a half hour ago, Vancouver is a hockey city. Yeah. It's a hockey city. I won't say it's a sports city. It's a hockey city. Right. Seattle is a sports city. And they have history there. You know, the Sonics have a long storied history prior to leaving to Oklahoma City. You know, you can go way back. You know, Freddie Brown, you know, back Jack Sigma, you know, obviously Gary Payton and the Rain Man and Nate McMillan and all the Dallas Shrimp, like those guys. So, and those fans were amazing. You look at, you know, you even look at the, the Seahawks fans. You know, that is a sports city. And I will say, if there is a – and I'm not saying that what the NBA should do is take a, a respective city from somewhere now and replace it. I don't care if you add them. What I'm saying is the Seattle Sonics deserve to be in the NBA. I'm not saying that someone, well, you got to take a team from here. No, I don't even care if you have to add it. The NBA has 31 teams. Or if you add a team there and add a team in Vegas, and it's 32 teams. But the Seattle Supersonics deserve a basketball team. Antonio, i got to ask this question. So I was in college in Philly when this happened. Mm -hmm. The Allen Iverson double cross slip and fall. Mm -hmm. If Instagram existed then, what would your mentions look like? 
Oh, the same thing they look like now when it comes up and says 10 years ago this happened or 11 years ago that happened. You know, <laughs> it's wild because I tell people all the time, people ask me all the time, you know, who are the toughest guys that you ever had to guard? And one of them was Allen Iverson. And the other guy was somebody you mentioned earlier, Stephon Marbury. Mm -hmm. Those to me were the two, and, and I played against Michael. I played against Kobe. I played against those guys. But TV does not give guys justice. It does not do guys, get, you know, so I tell people, when you see LeBron James on TV and you think, oh, well, you know what? Well, yeah, he's big and he's explosive if you only knew. If you only knew how big, how strong, and how explosive LeBron James is to play against. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about how he looks on television. I'm talking about in real life. Shaquille O'Neal. There's three guys I always say TV does not give guys the justice they deserve. One is LeBron James. Two is Shaquille O'Neal. That dude was so freaking dominant. People don't grasp the concept. Shaq is big as hell, like deceptively big. Right. And people don't get it because that same guy that's lovable and laughable that you see on NBA on TNT was a monster. That dude was a monster. Yeah. And the third guy was Allen Iverson. That dude was faster with the ball than most guys are without it. Mm -hmm. you, ever, you ever like talk with somebody about basketball and they say something like, oh, man, I do this to you. And they do something crazy with the ball. And you say, like, man, you can't do that in real life. No. Allen Iverson was that guy. You know, and as much as when those mentions come through and 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 like people say, oh, well, you got this and you got that. I, I will constantly if you are blessed to play in this league long enough and you are playing against the world's best night in and night out, getting embarrassed comes with the territory. It's you going to be guy. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's going to happen. And getting embarrassed means getting crossed, getting dropped, getting dunked on getting your shot blocked to the 50th row. If you are blessed to play in this league long enough, long enough with athletes that are this good, this fast, this explosive, this smart, and this agile, getting embarrassed comes with the territory. But it goes both ways because you will get embarrassed, but then you'll also have the opportunity to embarrass others along the way. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's real. Um, I asked you about Ray Allen and I wanted to, or Seattle at large. Um, when I asked you about Sharif Abdul Rahim, mm -hmm. how you know he had to adjust, and then you talked about previously a half an hour ago about um, Tim Duncan, you said he never had to adjust his game. When I look at Ray Allen, I see Ray Allen at spurts. I see Ray Allen playing like Jesus Shuttlesworth in Milwaukee, and then going um, to Seattle, and then going to Boston, and then Miami. It felt like he made that transition in between Seattle and Boston. Uh, that explosiveness shifted. When did you notice a shift in, in Ray Allen's game? Was it Seattle or was it after? Um, well, you know, the funny thing is you can remember the earlier Ray Allen in Milwaukee is, and the UConn Ray Allen being like a hell of an athlete. Mm -hmm. like, they're, they're banging on folks. And then it came a point, I, I tell you the thing about Ray Scoop that I'll never forget. He actually taught me the definition of work ethic and mm -hmm. what that really means. You know, um, and I tell you what's wild is when you know and you've seen up close and personal the amount of work someone puts in, what they do doesn't surprise you. Mm -hmm. so when Ray Allen hits that shot against the San Antonio Spurs in game six, I kid you not, when I tell you I have seen Ray Allen practice that shot over a thousand times, that same exact shot that he hit to beat the San Antonio Spurs in game six, Ray Allen was the dude that used to get to the arena, and I took this after I left Seattle. He used to get to the arena three, three and a half hours before the game. So if the game was at seven, Ray Allen would be there at 2.30, 3 o'clock, or 3.30, you know, 4 o'clock. So that way he was in Key Arena by himself watching that ball go in alone. And I would, I started going with him to shoot at the other end when he started doing it. Hence, I ended up having the best year of my career. <laughs> but just watching him 
do, as far as footwork is concerned, the same exact thing that he did there. Backpedal, because I heard so many people talking about it. Well, the wherewithal to know what the three-point line is, to be able to get his feet down and know that he was behind three I have seen him do that thousands and thousands of times to work on that when there's nobody else in the gym but him, myself, and a ton of ball boys just to rebound for him. His work ethic is unparalleled. Yeah, you, 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 that's what everybody says. Um, he was very particular, even the way he yeah. tucked in his jersey, um, you know, the way he, he had his sleeves on. I think he had two, not one. Um, he just was, was very particular. Um, do you think that when you look at his Celtics days um, and his Miami Heat days, it makes people forget about the rest of his career because he won yeah. championships there? Yes. Yeah, but but that's usually what um, that's usually what championships do. Because mm-hmm. you know, now that that thrusts you into a completely different category, where now the focus is on the championship as opposed to just your resume. Sure. Prior to winning a championship, people talk about okay, how many All Star games do you have? You know, uh, how many first teams uh, NBA do you have? How many second teams? They they talk about your individual accolades. People forget sometimes who he was in Seattle. It, it's almost like Ray Allen's career started when he went to Boston and won a championship, you know, and then went to Miami and won a championship there. No, Ray was a beast throughout the from from day one in the NBA to the day that he walked away. But the difference is from day one to the time that he won a championship, the talk was about him individually. And from that point, from the time he won a championship one to championship two, it became more about his leadership as opposed to just his skill set. Couple more questions. Number one, uh, you are on Sirius XM, uh, mm-hmm. I mean radio. Uh, do you prefer radio better than TV? How do you prepare for both? Oh man, what a difference. What the thing about TV is you always have to be on. Yes. I am a I am a big um facial expression guy. No. Yeah. So when I'm on TV, when I'm on TV, I have to be cognizant of that. You know, yeah. somebody says something crazy and you're like, dude, you crazy. On the radio, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I can sit there on the radio, my personality and my work ethic are gonna follow me wherever I go. So I will always be prepared. I will always be prepared, whether TV or radio. But radio, I can sit there and do my Sirius XM show and sweat. You know, I don't got to get dolled up. I don't have to have a suit on. None of that stuff. I can sit there and sweat and, you know, be just as passionate, be just as energetic. TV is different. TV, you got to be mic'd up. You got to be ready to go. You know, uh, I got to wipe off the, the sweat spots and all of these different things that, you know, you know what I'm talking about. All of these different things that are happening. So um the preparation for both is the same but you know actually doing actually doing i'm gonna be me you know that's the one thing i learned about media like i'm gonna be me um some people will like it some people won't but it's hard work trying to be somebody else where do the celtics need to improve in the off season to prepare for next year mm. i think they've improved in the off season by doing what they've done this year first and foremost Honestly, and the reason I say that is because you can't expedite experience. You can't expedite it, you know, and Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, um, Kimball Walker, Gordon Hayward, those guys have to learn to close games collectively. They have to learn that. And they have to learn to play in big time games like they did this year. They're going to be better again next year. They'll be right back again next year. Um, and it's easy to say, like, well, they could get this and they can get that. that. That's easier said than done. Again, those guys have to t- continue to progress like they've been doing. You know, uh, Jason Tatum, now he's on, he's on a star radar. He's on that star radar. He's, now his responsibility um, and his reputation have grown. Now you expect more out of him. Where will Zach Levine and the Bulls benefit from Billy Donovan? I, I think the biggest thing with, with them is – They are getting a coach that is accustomed to connecting to young players. That is a young, inexperienced team. 
So it does no good to bring in a, a coach that is set in his way. This is how it's going to be and going to drop the hammer. No, Billy Donovan, again, is a back-to-back NCAA champion. There's a reason. You heard Joe Kim Noah say before, you know what, like, that's the best coach I've ever had. That says something. When a player says something like that about a coach, that means we had a connection. And when you have guys like Kobe White and Lori Markinen and Zach Levine and Wendell Carter Jr., and they're going to get younger, you need a coach that can connect to these guys that make them believe in themselves, that can instill in confidence in these young guys and mold them. Billy Donovan was a perfect hire for the Chicago Bulls, in my opinion. Will Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and the Nets be able to adjust to play alongside each other right away? Okay, give me the definition of right away. Let me rephrase my question. (laughs) Okay. Will Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, will it be an adjustment period to playing alongside each other? Yes. I think there's I think there's always an adjustment period when you have um, stars of that magnitude and they team up. I, I mean, you know, it, it's easy it's easy to say when we're in the locker room together, man, we're gonna love playing together. Like this is gonna be awesome. There's always an adjustment period. Russell Westbrook and James Harden they had a relationship mm-hmm. way that, that stemmed way back prior to the NBA. You know, being in Oklahoma City the last four years, the one guy. After the game that I saw Russell Westbrook always seek out and hug and give that to with James Harden. Everybody else, he's gone. So they had a relationship prior to this year. And there was an adjustment period for them. So you best believe when you have a Kyrie Irving that's used to being that guy and a Kevin Durant that's used to being that guy, there's always a an adjustment period that's going to come with two guys that are um, that good, I'll say. The last part of my sermon, I had my intro, three points, conclusion, and now we're going into the benediction. Okay. <laughs> is, um, what's next for you? Hmm. You know what I always answer to that, honest Coop? Um, I honestly feel like the Lord would not send me somewhere that he has not qualified me to succeed. Sure. He's equipped me. He's equipped me with all I need. Um, I'm just waiting on him to open the door. And when he's opened the door, um, I'll be prepared. Whatever that door looks like, I have no idea. You know, the, you know, scripture says, you know what, we can have our plans, but God determines our steps. So my plans realistically don't matter. Whatever he has in store for me, I'm ready for it. And I know he has equipped me to succeed, whatever that looks like. Order my steps. <laughs> That's it, man. Here's the good news. You're off the high seat. I appreciate you, brother. This wasn't hot seat, man. This is all fun, man. Yes, this sir. is all fun. Anytime you need me, I'm back for you, brother. You already know, man. Good to talk to you. You too, brother. All right, man. Be safe out there. Man, you too. Sir. Antonio Daniels, heavy live with Scoop Bean.